Welcome to The Gray Report. I'm your host, Spencer Gray, joined by co-host Dr. Matt Bosnagel, <laughs> Director of Communications and Marketing here at Gray Capital. If you're a multifamily investor, you want to be a multifamily investor, you're in the industry, you want to ramp up your knowledge of what's going on in the multifamily industry, real estate, the housing market, and just the macro economy, you're in the right spot because we're trying to help you make some really good decisions, keep you up to speed with these fast-moving waters that is the economy, but especially in the multifamily industry. We are active investors at Great Capital, but we also love sharing information in the latest data reports and research, again, to keep you up to speed and make the most well-informed decisions. Great articles and reports. We're talking about new GDP numbers from the BLS, a new report from Rent.com. Case Shiller's got some new information, and then articles from the New York Times, Politico, and a pretty good article from Forbes as well. Matt, we got a lot to cover. Yeah. Maybe entering a crypto winter. Good buying opportunities. Let's talk about it and get into it. All right. Welcome back to the Gray Report, Matt. Exciting week. We got a lot yeah. to cover today. We, I mean, I, I was having trouble keeping up. Almost. I know. Well, <laughs> and we're recording this a day late. I was out um, on uh, on location up at a property up in Michigan. <laughs> Things kept happening, by the way. <laughs> they they kept happening, but all all is good. But you know, as the week goes on, more information, more yeah. reports. They just stack up. We can't even get to everything mm -hmm. this week that we want to. And we're going to cover some things next week. Got exciting um, interview with Carl Whitaker from Real Page going on next week as well, and we cover you know their Real Page, Jay yeah. Parsons, Carl Whitaker all the time. So excited for that. Um, some news about Real Page. I think we're going to get to next week as well. Yeah. Um, but how are you feeling? You know, just take, taking the temperature check. You know, you go through, you process all these yeah. reports, Matt, on a on a daily basis. <laughs> so like, give us the just give us like your gut. Like, how, how do you feel about I'm the multifamily kind of, market? I'm kind of excited. Um, you know, there's a we've been we've been deadened and moderated and normalized so yeah. much where uh, like I, I'm beginning to think and we were just talking about this like there's some exciting maybe opportunities coming up um, because I think that that a lot of the negative aspects of this economy are um, are that multifamily is insulated from them a little bit um, yeah. so and we'll go we'll get into this but a lot of the bad news I was kind of looking all right what's the we're a multifamily podcast. What's the multifamily angle? And um, for investors, I don't think that that it's nearly the doom and gloom that people may think it is. Yeah, I, I mean, it. To be clear, it sucks right now. Yeah, like yeah. right now, today, past month or so, it, it's it's not fun. If you're trying to yep. do a deal um, with interest rates, it, it is it is a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, to you put a deal under contract, and you're 90 days away, you know, 60, 90 days away. That's under contract, not when you make an offer. You're 120 days when you first underwrite a deal, make an offer to you know guesstimate where interest rates are going to be over the last month it's been you know a, a fool's errand to an extent because you mm -hmm. we just we just don't know yeah um and you know i was talking to one of our partners big multifamily investor they got you know six seven thousand unit portfolio and it's uh it's it's very hard um, to make any decisions because we just don't have yeah. that stability. We don't have um, something you can kind of predict of like, all right, where are rates going to be, mm -hmm. and you know, will when when will they moderate? Will they moderate at all? Is it going to be six months, eighteen months for a recession to rates lower? Um, you know, it, it's a lot of timing that is a little dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, but the one thing that is consistent. Um, from people who are, you know, got their heads screwed on right. They're not just looking to raise money for just getting some fees, but it's the long term makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It's just navigating this next, you know, year or so, year or so bat um, you know, battering down the hatches, getting through mm -hmm. the prospects for the long term are great. Yeah. And in the kind of short term, um, there may be some incredible buying opportunities because it is switched from a seller hardcore seller's market market the strongest seller's market that we've ever seen mm -hmm. to now it's a buyer's market yeah retrades going on all the time repricing across the board do you feel like this is much much more of a buyer's market than it was at the beginning of the pandemic when people were in the wait and see mode um yeah i think i think so that's um, because I, I think people are, are a little bit more nervous mm -hmm. about where in the pandemic people were much more in wait and see mode yeah. where now there's this idea that prices have fallen and they may fall more within the next six months. Hmm. 
to a year. Yeah. And so if you need to sell now, what's the, here's what's happening. It's, it's very, very bifurcated. You either need to sell, mm-hmm. you, you've got to sell, and you're, we've seen groups taking a loss. Yeah. Or sell, you know, breaking even, mm-hmm. or not nearly the upside that they thought. Or they can hold on to it. They can just hold on, and they're just holding on. So I think we're going to see deals drying up outside of the deals that um, need to sell. But for new buyers, you, it has to be just a killer deal at a strong cap rate because yeah. the, the I mean you're, we're paying six percent uh, interest on the debt. Yeah, you know tomorrow could be more, or today it's actually a little bit less. Was it ten years down? Mm-hmm. Who knows what's going to happen next week? And but so it just they don't pencil. They just do absolutely do not pencil mm-hmm. at all. And so what everyone's looking for are you know de- uh, op- opportunities with assumable debt that has some sort of leverage, maybe a little bit of interest only still left on. And there are those deals out there. We're doing two of them right now, hopefully two, at least one. And that's the only way that you can make sense of it. If like the debt that you're assuming is okay, the purchase price makes sense, your leverage is still all right. Yeah. Um, but there's those are few and far between. Um, placing new debt on a new acquisition again, unless the cap rate is is very high, it it, it is it is difficult and, and yep. nearly nearly impossible not impossible but it's it's tough. Um, so I think volumes are dropping off. They're gonna I think gonna continue to drop off because again it's not a great environment to sell. We'll just hold on for the next year or two, see mm-hmm. what happens. But the opportunities are the folks that are on these shorter term bridge loans that are on float floating rate yeah. so their cash was already getting crushed because their interest rate has doubled mm-hmm. from six months ago to today their cash flow sucks yeah. they have to do something because their bridge loan is going to expire probably you know next year mm-hmm. they can't refinance it or if they do they're going to pay a very high interest rate lock in at a you know with a large prepayment penalty for a longer period of time. So it's going to take any exit off the table for a while. They're not going to be able to get any cash out. This is if they even can refinance. Yeah. So selling it's going to probably make more sense. Hmm. And they're just going to, and the market's going to be what the market's going to be. Yeah. So if you have a lot, if you've set up your investment to be able to hold on, have the option to hold on the long term, you're, you're, you're good. Like there's not a whole lot of worries. Mm-hmm. You've got a well operating property that's stabilized. You've got fixed debt, or you floating rate with the cap. Um, you're good if you can o- if you can operate. There's still yeah. challenges, but there's going to be some folks that are going to be at a relatively bad spot, and that's going to be create a pretty good buying opportunity. Yeah, the, I remember reading something a couple weeks ago that that seemed to say that. The loans are going to come due maybe around 2023. Yeah, 20, 2024 maybe not so much, but I think 20. When I've looked at CoStar data mm-hmm. and because you know we're, we're we've, there's properties that we're like monitoring and yeah. tracking and looking at the debt and um, 2023, 2024, okay. really kind of Q1, Q2, 24 in, okay. in, into Q3, but it's going to start um, yeah. at kind of the beginning of um, Q1 of 23. That's Q2. that's really interesting, and I don't think that. The wind down of whatever Federal Reserve interest rate hikes, wherever we come at the peak, I don't think that wind down is going to have going to be fully finished. Yeah, the the only thing that can save some of those groups, and again, this would not be negative. It just might not be as big of a buying opportunity mm-hmm. because prices won't fall. But if you know we do realize uh, you know a global economic recession, which we just got GDP numbers, we had a positive GDP yeah. GDP print, so it's going to be even harder for you know to say it's, it's an official re- recession. Mm-hmm. Um, but if we do get some kind of real economic pullback, um, you know, one of the first things that typically central banks do is lower rates. Yeah. Um, and um, then all of a sudden these deals will just work out just fine. People will be able to refinance. But that's a big that's a big if. Yeah. And again, that's a big timing question that no one no one knows. Yeah. The smartest people in the world don't know. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of just a little quick update on the market, mm-hmm. kind of where our, our head is at. Um, yeah. You know, the last thing to note, and I mentioned this last week, but just, you know, it's going to be a focus on operations and expenses. Yeah. Um, the next year or two. Um, yeah. Because- fundamentals. Fundamentals for multifamily remain strong. Um, yeah. And that was, you know, that's another thing that I've noticed. It's like, it's not like people are falling off. Housing demand in general really is still yeah. pretty strong. Yeah. Um, so. And I'm also predicting just anecdotally real-time information across our portfolio and some others. I think we'll see, you know, 
know, a decent pick back up in demand um, when October's numbers um, come out. Oh, kind of okay. we're seeing that across our portfolio from yeah. a really decline in um, September. We'll see if that's the case, kind of nationwide, region wide. Um, but then I think it's probably going to slow down quite a bit here. Um, yeah. When, we, as soon as we hit Thanksgiving, it's going to just probably slow down for okay. the next couple months. So that is where that yeah. is where we're at, Matt. It's the winter. <laughs> it, 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 it is the winter. Well, it um, feels like it, maybe. <laughs> you know what? You just got to make some preparations and, you know, That's, take the right steps. Bundle up. Bundle be, up. Bundle up. <laughs> be prepared. Insulate yourself. <laughs> Look, we were up, I was up in Michigan yesterday. We are making our... all. Confirming all of our snow removal plans. You just, oh, nice. Yeah, you gotta yeah. make gotta make plans for it. That's gotta, true. Got to be just a little proactive. Um, let's. Uh, so we talked about the GDP print. We're going to talk about mm-hmm. uh, some reports first, Matt. Um, so let's just first go to this uh, print of GDP. Not like a, a a ton of you know analysis from our end besides. Um, Positive GDP following a negative GDP print in Q2 is a negative uh, 0.6. We had positive 2.6. It mm-hmm. was a little bit of an upside surprise um, because this was uh, actually you know higher than um, or about at the same rate as like Q3 and 21 when like mm-hmm. the economy was just on on fire. It was so. expected. I think maybe the prediction was like 2.3 positive. Yeah. Um, the fact that it's that it's 0.3 more is is still pretty good. Um, I also think it's, I mean, even in their summary, it says that the increase in the third quarter primarily reflected increases in exports and consumer spending that were partly offset by a decrease in housing investment. Mm. Um, the housing is one of, you know, it's the most sensitive area to uh, mortgage rate increases. Yeah, rates, yeah. So um, that's very predictable. And it, and it shows how... Uh, you know how all of this stuff that we're hearing about housing is, uh, you know, it's so closely tied to the Federal Reserve, yeah. and um, and I think that that it's almost a little bit of a lagging indicator too, and like the effects of a couple months ago's interest rate hikes are still circulating and percolating yeah. <laughs> through the market. But it's going to be interesting watching the stock market and the real estate market because you know the stock market is a forward looking indicator. You know, looking maybe six, yeah. eight months in in the future, where you know, the housing market. Is like a total lagging indicator, mm-hmm. and um, so kind of where we are is somewhere in be- maybe between the two yeah. and the election um, coming up here in the next couple of weeks, yeah. November. That's going to give some clarity to the economy, and um, it'll just be interesting. In you know, the stock market's not always right, but they do have a way of you know predicting future economic activity and at least yeah. investors' sentiment, and um, it'll be interesting to see if we see a rally and basically indicating that like all right, we're gonna we. We've already been predicting the recession, and now it's going to be predicting the upside. But it doesn't have to ha- happen either. Yeah. There's no there's no rule that says we're going to have a short term short recession or or a long recession. There's really smart people calling for for both right now. Yeah, and, yeah, it is so shaky that. And yeah. but I also you know it it does make me think that different parts of the economy are going to do differently. Good point. Um, yeah, and you know there is, and we're going to go through an article that talks about a little bit about the uh, kind of this weight and see mentality that's very much a kind of a doomsayer um but it's not it's not going to be all the same everywhere and if you want to focus on the things that are going to do bad you will be right those things will do bad if you know um but but there but that could perhaps blind yourself a little bit to some of the areas of the economy that would be either insulated Mm. or maybe doing a little bit better than others yeah yeah I'm going to pop it. Let's go to the yeah. next report. Where, where, where do you want to go, man? You want to Zumpers. go to Zumper? Yeah. Let's go to the Zumper National Rent Report. Um, and I, I'm excited. We didn't even preview this, Matt, but <laughs> I'm like, we've got, um, we've got, well, I don't even oh, want to yeah, tell we got people. Some tools, yeah. We've got some new tools, some aggregate data um, that's a great report exclusive. So we'll get to those in a second. But Zumper National Rent Report came out on good old October 25th. Um, notable, notable trends, man. Yeah. So Zumper has. Um, the uh, year over year, re- this year over year report, uh, rent growth is at 9%. Um, and their take on the market it is, is very similar to a lot of what we've been discussing. It, they said that in response to the recent, to a recent Zumper survey, 76% of US respondents said they think we're in a recession. Since 
High interest rates and inflation continue pushing potential buyers out of the market. We're still seeing relatively strong competition for rentals and therefore don't expect hmm. drastic price drops until supply and demand become more closely aligned. However, we do expect a significant amount of new supply will finally hit the market over the next six months, yeah. putting pressure on property owners to compete for residents and driving prices down. Uh, again, that echoes a lot, but I do think that um, it's worth keeping in mind that apartment supply, and we've been hearing a lot, this is another thing we've been hearing a lot, is like, oh, new apartment supply is gonna come online, so nationally these uh, rents are gonna come down. But uh, it's so hard to say, since it's such a local thing, to make these uniform statements yeah. is, uh, so it's gonna be a little inaccurate. Each each metro is gonna have a different experience of, of that. So some places could have a ton of new apartment buildings come online, and others could have very little. And um, when and there's a, you know places like Dallas-Fort Worth, yeah. they could have a bunch that really skew the average and there may be dozens of cities that don't have as much. Yeah. So, no, th without a doubt there's going to be markets that have a ton of supply delivered but it all mm -hmm. gets absorbed. Yeah. In, in like a Dallas Fort Worth, you know, maybe one of those. Yeah. Um, then there's going to be some uh, I don't want to say w which market uh, but like <laughs> I, I don't know, but are are going to be oversupplied, and the demand's not going to be there. In other markets, the demand's there. There's just there's not as much supply coming mm -hmm. online. So, absolutely 100. percent I mean, real estate is always so local. And looking at some of these national um, reports, I mean, you can see trends on the national reports, mm -hmm. um, but you got to take the closer look. Yep, for sure. Yeah, if you want to jump into that. Uh so I did, I did over the past few months, uh, been kind of preparing a little, uh, a little chart, and um, I don't know if you, I, I don't know what yet we can call it, but it's uh, there is at least ten. Um, and th I've, I've said before, uh, time and time again, I really love how many, uh, how many organizations are putting out data on the apartment yeah. market. It is a, uh, a wealth of information. And th I found this was easy for me to find 10 of these sources um, that, that put out monthly rent reports yeah. for year over year rents. And, um, and I don't have any uh, fancy weighting or algorithms yet. Maybe that comes next month. <laughs> you don't have to tell people, man. We can say we yeah, got, yeah, yeah. This, this is, is all. This is all on AI and the blockchain. <laughs> it's proprietary Cloud algorithms and in the metaverse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're putting in the metaverse. That's good. We got it all. We're ready to be listed on. <laughs> Um, on but, NASDAQ. But we do have is at a glance, you can see what each organization's, uh, what each company's view of rent growth was. So right now, I, you know, I have some numbers just to put things in context. I've got the August 22, 2022 year over year rent growth and the September 2022 rent growth. And you can see Zumper that we, which we just covered, had um, for August and September, actually a, a little bit of an uptick in rents that we just covered their October report, which jumped back down to nine, um, but that's but you know that's some of the things that you'll see, and you'll also see that CPI rents are the most you know kind of sluggish moving um, of these, where it's you know yeah. it's it has showing the lowest rent really the lowest rent growth right now is coming from the apartments.com kind of the same CoStar owns them, um, but they have they have among the lowest at here I have it in my notes here the exact number uh, <laughs> seven yeah eight, so, eight eight. Yeah, so it was about eight, and then it it was seven point two, and then it went down to five. Um, yeah, sorry, that was the CPI was at seven point two, and the apartments dot com is down to five point eight now. Um, so definitely low on the low end. Zillow is a is is among the highest, if not the highest, um, for August, but then it's, it jumps down. Really, there's a. It's it's worth taking a look at these two to see which which ones of these are typically measuring higher than normal rents, um, which ones are you know a little bit more modest and reserved, and um, just the average itself. What did the average say? It's like a ten point. If you can hover over that, it might. Yeah, let's uh, let's hover over it. Um, yeah, so on average, September. Um, for 2022, is 8.76 okay. before 2000. Or do I have these? But yeah, yeah, for August 2022, um, we had 10.6. So, so yeah, month over month. And and I think it is as much as there is some uh, some outliers here or there. None of them are the same, and none of them are wildly different. Especially none of them are are like 
overly generous, um, with the exception of maybe Zillow's August numbers. But then again, you know they all they all came down. Um, so we'll we'll keep tracking this. I'll have some I'll have some line graphs eventually once oh, we yeah, get once we get more numbers. Good data visualization yeah. options because it'd be nice to it'd be cool to see like baking the spread. Also, we can just yeah. just see what the spread is real quick. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know the year over year stuff is great. Then also the you know the when this is kind of uh, this is month over month year over year yeah, yeah. i know that's yeah. what i almost yeah. i almost made that mistake i was like well this one shows but but no it's all all of these are both each and of and these obviously are compared an, to last an, year. annualized yeah annualized growth um it, it's you know it's interesting to see the discrepancy which we've mm -hmm. made a lot of comments on you know over over uh you know the last year or so um but we're going to keep tracking this and bring yep. you more kind of aggregate um consolidated data with analysis um so Make sure you're, you are subscribed to That's the right. report, without a doubt. Um, all right, so now, Matt, you want to go to um, uh, rent.com? Yeah, that's, that's uh, which one it's with a big R on it. Yeah, yeah that, that, that would make sense. Um, all right, rent.com, what's, uh, what's the story here? Uh, this was a really interesting report. It showed, actually, um, a little bit higher rent growth uh, than, than I was expecting. Um, I, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but it oh. did... It did say that. Let's see here. Do we have it right here. Uh, yes, we. Yeah, if you you want to hover over it, we can find out. Yeah, we got our own. Um, so twelve point two six was the August number, and then September it was eight point seven nine. Um, and I think that this number may even be updated nationally. It says that rents are up eight point eight percent compared to last year. So this is their October numbers. This, along with Zumper, are you know at the head, on, kind of at the head of the pack, um, and they're showing a slight decrease in in year over year rent growth compared to eight, from eight point nine to eight point eight. So it's almost a little bit promising that uh, the decrease is decelerating um, as far as the yeah uh, you know kind of compare I mean, it to others. Yeah, I think we'll we're gonna see throughout winter um, how you know bad or or not as bad as it gets. I mean, obviously that change month over month is the only kind of the negative print that we've seen. Not too atypical to see some you know pullback mm -hmm. in rent this time of year. Just a divergence from the long trend that we've had of basically all positive growth, um, besides maybe a little bit of a blip back here last December yeah. um, or January. Um, oh, really? This was really October, so I mean, relatively not too dissimilar in terms of uh, month over month trends. Um, but I mean, still all in all, I mean, very strong growth yeah. in terms of looking at the past 12, 18 months, but, uh, certainly things are pumping the brakes yeah. without a doubt. And rent.com also has a list of the major winners, uh, or, or, or the, uh, the strongest markets, let's say, um, when it comes to change in median level, uh, median level rents year over year and, um, Beyond the state, the uh, the actual markets. I think Indianapolis is is among there, and oh, it yeah. may and we may see uh, Philadelphia. I'm not sure. We, we might have to scroll past the states. There we go. Um, oh, wait, that's metro area. Those are our year over year state decreases. Okay. okay. Metro area rent price trends. Um, we got OKC up 24.1 percent, mm -hmm. doing really great. Um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, up 20 percent. We got the Indianapolis MSA up at you know, just a hair under 18%. We got Louisville, uh, Jefferson County mm -hmm. um, up at 17 and a half. Then Nashville, Cincinnati, um, Raleigh, and then New York all kind of following below that. Um, I'd say, you know, we've got two markets in here, Matt, um, that are our target markets that are mm -hmm. in the top four. I just want to highlight that yeah. are not always on everyone's radar. Yep. Indy and um, Louisville. So, yeah, it's good to see that um, Indiana I, in to the top four, if you include Jefferson, uh, Jefferson County, which they're including the MSA. So. Yeah, well, there was another article about uh, about places with low cost of living, and there was a couple places, a uh, few places in 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 Indiana. There was uh, Fort Wayne, yeah. Lafayette, and and Elkhart was there too. I mean, they have that growing economy. Um, but I, I've been seeing a lot of about Pittsburgh rent growth, and really even actually uh, Oklahoma City. So this is not it's not just Rent.com that's that is seeing these uh, yeah. seeing these markets that yeah. are growing. So just wanted to note that it's um, it's interesting, you know, because like a market like those you mentioned in Indiana and some of these Midwestern markets, you know, we've seen strong rent growth. But if you look at incomes, um, rent to income ratios, there a lot of these are still kind of the bottom of the pack. Yeah, I mean, Indi mm -hmm. Indi Indianapolis was what twenty four third out of twenty four 
Um, yeah, among uh, it was either the all the largest metros, or was it? It was either the lowest or the second lowest. It was the second lowest. Kansas yeah. City was the lowest. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they were like twenty three percent. You know, rent to income ratio, they're both pretty close twenty three yeah. twenty four. Um, but we're also seeing some of the strongest rank growth, which means that incomes are coming up, picking up. Yeah. Um, you know, very low unemployment rates, you know, like an in Indy for, you know, why is that Indianapolis is such a strategic, um, location for logistics and mm-hmm. FedEx is doubling down. They're hiring a lot more. Um, FedEx has the second largest, um, hub in the world in Indianapolis. Yeah. Um, we have the, some the most cargo traffic out of any major airport goes through Indianapolis. Um, throughout the United States, we are spoiled because sometimes we get our Amazon uh, shipments yeah. the day of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and C- CSX also has a major um, their regional headquarters hmm. here. Um, among then we've got a ton of other you know um, industries, bio life science, advanced yeah. manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there's plenty of jobs available, paying decent wages, mm-hmm. very low unemployment rate, housing is relatively affordable, things in general are affordable. Yeah. Um, the only thing that any Hoosier would acknowledge is, you know, no oceans, no mountains. We have no navigable wa- bodies of water, unfortunately. We've got a well, I mean, we got Lake Michigan, but we got we got we got a sliver of it. We got, yeah, we got the port yeah. of Indiana up yeah. there. Anyway, we we bore the rest of the audience talking about Indiana, but we're we're excited and we love we love investing close to home, which yeah. is great. Matt. Are we ready to go to some of these articles? Yeah, let's go far from home. <laughs> far from home. Let's go to the big. Let's go to the Big Apple, the big city. Um, where those who uh, consider um, those us out here in the Midwest to be, yeah, maybe not that smart. Um, but uh, you know, we like yeah. New Yorkers. We they like yeah. us once we they get to know us. Um, at least live in New York. So, um, I remember Alex. And sort of personal story. Alex. So an Alex. Um, is co-founder of, of Gray Capital. You know, she went to school in New York City, and um, the, one of her first day of classes, and she said she was from Indiana. Mm-hmm. Everyone, the questions were, it's like, oh, so you like you lived, you grew up on a farm, like, yeah. So you did grow up on a farm, she, which she didn't. Um, she's like, my grandfather grew up, my my dad grew up on a farm, not yeah. not me. But uh, then then they were like, they they were seriously wondering if they we had internet yet, <laughs> and that she was familiar with the internet. And this was in oh, two thousand seven. So I'm um, like, are you guys are the ones who need to get out. But um, great. <laughs> Indoor plumbing. Great. Kind of thing. Great, great city. Um, New York Times. Um, this is an article, an opinion piece by Ezra Klein. Matt, what does Ezra have to say about the way Los Angeles is trying to solve homelessness? So, yeah. So this is, this is about, um, it is an example that I think he spins out. To a really to some really useful insights about housing and specifically affordable housing um, in general. Now, last week we discussed an article from the New York Times that described the efforts of Kansas City um, activists to influence policymakers' decisions mm-hmm. to, to yeah. create more uh, uh, affordable housing. There were some compelling arguments they had. I think you know letting a lawyer in on eviction proceedings that's uh, that seems sensible. But that being said, there was not enough um, in that article for me to dig in the process of creating affordable housing. Um, it was a lot much more about the f- the focus on the individuals involved and their kind of, and their individual disagreements, their individual yeah. kind of values and how that fight was was like yeah. affecting them and their, and their problems. And some of the frustrations yeah. and just more of the emotional side, mm-hmm. of, which is all totally understandable and, and you know. Yeah. But yeah, very understandable. Uh, but this article, which I really appreciated and um, uh, I almost don't have enough to say about it, is, uh, is Ezra Klein does an ex- excellent job of digging into the things that need to happen to build affordable housing. The, um, it, it, and he does it in a way that's not limited to the LA market at that, that's a subject of the article. Sure, there's a lot of regulations that make LA unique when it comes to housing dis- construction, um, but Ezra Klein deftly extends the most relevant issues to provide a valuable overview, I think, of the barriers to affordable housing throughout the United States. Um, the, uh, the actual article centers around this program that they had. Um, I think it was a billion dollars plus um, that's still in the process of, you know, they're still spending that billion dollars, they're still building it, they're having trouble. Um, And the price per unit for these, uh, so they're building affordable housing, they're building more apartments, the price per unit of those apartments is $596,000, nearly $600,000 um, in a, well, yeah, I know it's in LA, California or but but I still think that, uh, well, and, and the no. rest of the article is, that, that's expensive. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. And, it's, yeah. and it's too expensive. Um, and as a way of figuring out why it's so expensive, he goes through the things that need to happen, like I said, mm-hmm. for something to get built. But more importantly, and I, I really think this is almost the focus of the article, is like, who do you need to please? Who needs to get approval of this of each project at every step yeah. of the way before things happen? Um, you know, he, he goes through the actual process, like first you get land, um, and then you, you know, you do tests, and then you, you know, there's all these things. And it's almost like the story of a Hollywood show, how it starts as a comedy and then the producers get a hold of it. And all of a sudden it's a work, yeah. you know, all of a sudden it's a cop drama and it's completely different. Yeah. You know, they're talking about a building that starts as maybe, you know, just a simple multifamily. And then, yeah, we want single... the facade to be made. Of, and then, yeah, we need these set these setbacks and yeah, X yeah. for parking uh, can and you put this on a, cosmetic. Now it's and we some... like this brick versus that brick. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 It is. Uh, a it's a group thing, but also it's just like a. <laughs> A, a trial of a thousand cuts make your metaphor if you're gonna here. build this in our community you're gonna do it the way we want you to do it yeah and all of them have and i've said this before it's like all, whether it's regulators or these people on the neighborhood councils like they all have valid points but at a certain point if you're trying to please every single one of them you're gonna make someone mad and that i think is a big point of this is is What's the bigger problem? Is the bigger problem going to be traffic somewhere, or is it going to be alleviating uh, affordable housing? Yeah. Is a bigger, you know, is the bigger problem going to be the uh, blocking the shade of someone or giving someone a home? So there, someone is going to be unhappy, and we're gonna, and that's and that's what he he says even at the beginning is like I'd love to to tell you that this is a simple mm-hmm. thing that there's an easy solution we can just just like here we can just do this. Why don't they do this? Well, no, we know why they don't. It's because it's really tough. Yeah. And it's because you're going to make some people mad, and that's that's what's that's yeah. Really, it's such a process. Yeah, yeah. It's such a process. Yeah, I mean, un- unfortunately, it's a complicated solution, especially mm-hmm. in places like Los Angeles or you know, New York and these markets that have are overly overly regulated. Every market's got a ton of regulations, mm-hmm. and, and some of them make a, t- a lot of sense. But you know, then to a point of your what you were saying, Matt is. We have to prioritize what's the bigger problem. Yeah. You know, increasing you know, traffic count or maybe not having the ideal amount of parking spaces or mm-hmm. the idea ideal cosmetics of the of the property. Yep. Or if this is a severe housing crisis, we should act like we're in a crisis. Yeah. And I, a, are we? Is there a? Tra- I mean, yeah, maybe LA does have a traffic crisis, but you know, and <laughs> and as okay. applicable as it is, which I think it is, this is like it's almost like an object lesson in in the challenges you have to get something approved <laughs> to yeah. get a million dollar project approved. Uh, the way LA's trying to solve homelessness is absolutely insane. There's a lot of absolutely insane that can be found in every city yeah. um, when it comes mm-hmm. to you know pleasing mm-hmm. person X. Now you please person Y, and, um, and I was, th- you know, I was thinking about uh some of the some of the regulations that uh that that we've kind of had to had to deal with and that that a lot of people are thinking of and yeah it's it's closer to home than people think yeah it just um just yeah. slows down the process yeah so all right well let's uh, pop on over to um uh, a little bit of politico is that similar yeah or you wanna, oh no or you it's definitely this is i think this is a good transition. this is the this is a perfect follow-up so we went from la now we're in new york new york city um pairs really well with new york times as this idea of you know something's got to give um deregulation Specifically, easing up on some environmental regulations in New York City um, is uh, is a topic of a, a kind of an initiative from Mayor Eric Adams, who seeks to exempt apartment developments with 200 and fewer units from environmental review. Um, and just to summarize, it says that the environmental studies, which accompany nearly all applications for zoning and land land use changes determine the impact of a new project on a neighborhood. They estimate how many students would be enrolled in nearby schools, how traffic patterns would be snarled by extra cars on the road, and how sunlit oases might be darkened by new shadows. Mm -hmm. I really appreciated this example, especially in the context of that New York Times article we just talked about. Really, even going back to some of the home builder surveys that we've gone over, um, this is a concrete example of what we're dealing with when home builders talk about delay delays and expenses uh, associated with regulations. I'm sure you've got to pay someone to do that traffic study. And you probably have to pay someone to look at, you know, the way that lights are going to go or whatever. These are the these are the people involved, whether it's the school that wants to know how, you know, how to staff at school in case a lot of people come in. They're all valid. Mm -hmm. But he's saying like, okay, we got to get these in. I at this point, I kind of don't care as much. Yeah, Yeah. yeah, we'll figure out the rest. So I think it's uh, 
it, again, it's sensible, but um, but the size limitations, taking away these reviews for 200 or less, that is a little bit maybe of a compromise. It's like, all right, this is going to be less of an impact than a thousand yeah. unit big well, complex. In, in, the, in those that you know proponents of rent control, you know, looking at New York City as an example, and Los Angeles, but New York City, mm-hmm. you know, in this case, you know, they've they've tried, you know, they've tried rent control. They, yeah. They've thrown all the regulations for going against you know landlords mm-hmm. and you know thing they need to get the landlords in check. Well, you know, they've tried all of that, and now this is what they're doing, because the rest of it didn't work. I said last time, you know, there was a wing of the left wing, or whatever I said, uh, where they're, they're realizing that, like, this end, the end rules, where it's like rent control and just kind of putting the Band-Aid, those don't work as well yeah. as the creating the it's housing. Trying to get pragmatic. Solution. I mean, if they're like, this is a problem, and if, like, let's look at mm-hmm. it just empirically and... What's they may this even bad. be ideologically opposed to it. They yeah. may think like, you well, know, you we are going to line the pockets of some people in this way, but maybe that's the only way to get things done. Um, it could be, a, like I said, a compromise. But uh, again, they want, and they're, because they're just thinking about it. You know, they were historically have been thinking about it the wrong way of mm-hmm. oh, you know, real estate developers, landlords. We don't want them making money, but yeah. we do want housing. Um, mm-hmm. We want housing supply, and so how yeah. do you get? How do you incentivize? someone to create more housing if they're not going to make any money on it they're not going to do it just for just for for fun i mean yeah it can be fun but like you know maybe if there's you're smart enough to you know be a developer you've got that skill set you're going to take it somewhere else you can actually you know make some money on that's where maybe they won't do it for six hundred thousand dollars a pop either maybe not well and and back this is what i was trying to think of when i was thinking about the new york times article is like every neighborhood wants the neighborhood resistance is such a big thing and sometimes neighborhoods will hide behind these things like uh uh like the school or the traffic impacts and they'll they'll cite those things in Mm -hmm. their opposition um and kind of obviating that getting rid of that makes greases things somewhat but you still have to disagree with neighborhoods the best the quote from the new York Times, and I'm going to botch it a little bit. It was like, what do we want? Affordable housing. Where do we want it? Anywhere but here. Yeah. And that's, I, I remember talking to someone from Indianapolis about an affordable housing um, affordable housing property that was planned to go up near his house. And he was like, you know what? I'm all, all about affordable housing, but but I don't want it in my Just back. Pr- prefer yeah. it wasn't oh, right there. Yeah, he almost said not in my backyard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, there's a name for that. Yeah, yeah. So it's tough. And 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 again, like I sympathize with a lot of people who uh, who are maybe a little bit fearful of their neighborhood changing, mm-hmm. but something has got to give. And um, and I think that governments are increasingly getting pushy about it. Not necessarily, uh, you know, restrictive, but they are. Yeah. Well, they're being forced to come up with some kind of some solution yeah and they're getting so much pressure and again these it's interesting the markets that have not tried rent control the political forces are, are forcing their hand of thinking maybe we should think about rent control yeah but the markets that have already been trying rent control are like yeah uh we already tried that it didn't yeah. it hasn't really solved the problem now actually we have to look at fixing it because it's not getting any better yeah. anytime soon want to switch over to this uh forbes piece man yeah Okay, um, so this is a, a I think a, a paid piece. Um, yeah, it's like I, I know it's still. Yeah. It, it, it's it, Matt's comment basically was like, "Hey, this is a good one." Um, I know that's exactly it. It's like it's one of the like the sponsor content. Yeah. Um, but I like I I almost think that the uh, that it, the headline is not hyperbolic enough. It says the market's Achilles heel. Watch housing. Mm. Um, but it but it describes a situation where. Um, not just watch housing, but like housing is already, it's already in some desperate straits. Um, if you're looking at some of the charts and just some of the data, uh, he has James Stack of in- Invest Tech. Um, <laughs> he has multiple metrics that show us just how high housing prices have risen. Um, and he marks the start of, of this rise at 2012. Um, I think that really the start of the steep rise was at uh, was in 2020. But regardless, it is uh, it's much steeper than uh, than previous housing bubbles. He compares it to the uh, the housing bubble of 2005 that really sank during the during the Great Recession, and then also the housing bubble of the early 1980s, um, and finds that really the run-up is much more steeper than what we're facing now. And um, I think we're on the other side of it, but the question is, how far do we have to fall? And 
and we were talking about this um, a little bit before the uh, recording, how unique are we now? Are we in a different stage? Does history repeat itself? Um, are we fools to even imagine? Usually rhymes, that we're right? Yeah. Usually rhymes. Yeah. I mean, that's that's. I mean, that's. We were just talking about this. You know, on one hand, that you know, there's cycles and the pendulum swings, and um, yeah, history usually rhymes. Um, but and you typically, you know, think about Howard Marks have said, you know, of is this people always say, oh, well, this is different. Time is different. This is time. Time is different. And usually it's not usually that different. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just different shades. Yeah. Um, that all being said, it, it not that this is lazy work by any means, but it, it may be more complicated than saying like that. OK, well, the last two housing cycles, you know, we're going to basically follow this very similar trajectory mm-hmm. when they were all caused by relatively different things. Yeah. And we're just in a very different environment right now. Mm-hmm. Um um, that is very novel and and unique. Yeah, that doesn't mean that we're going to completely just break away from historical trends. But I don't don't think that anyone's ready to say like, okay, well, we can just go from the playbook of the last few recessions or housing crashes. Even even looking at those trends, those the trend lines of the great uh, great financial crisis and the nineteen eighties housing bubble, they're different. They're they have different slopes on the upswing and the recovery. Some go higher than you know the run up to the Great Recession was a little bit higher than the uh, than the nineteen eighties one, and the nineteen eighties had a slower slope downward than the. Uh, so every single one of these lines are different, and there's different stories behind them. And I think a pandemic is a really huge story that uh, that it's going to complicate things. Yeah, uh, pandemic, war. Um, I mean, incredible amount of quantitative easing and central. I mean, we're, yeah. And then off a you know twelve. 10, 12 years of incredibly, you know, low interest rates, but not mm-hmm. a lot of inflation. It's it, it's hard to find a really good um, analog. Yeah, I I but it's good to keep note. Yeah, sometimes. and it's true. And, and I also don't think that noting these valid connections means that we're blind to a housing bubble forming in the same way that I don't think that all of these factors are equally important drivers of home price trends at any given period of time. There's huge amounts of variables that go into home prices. Some may be more relevant in the 80s. Some may be more relevant yeah. um, in 2005, like the subprime mortgages. Yeah. Um, but I think a huge driver of home prices on the run up two years ago and on the downswing today is the Federal Reserve. You know, the, the, it was near oh, zero yeah. well, and yeah, now the, it's huge. And uh, yeah, I, I most just, common denominator. Yeah, it, the Federal Reserve was involved in all of all of this. Um, yeah, other factors, but um, you know, if they can't break it, they will break it. Make it great for you know a good cycle, and then uh, you know they. It's, Thus take uh, giveth, thus uh, taketh away. Yeah. Well, and that's another thing too is like, yes, there. It's the the Federal Reserve has has control over the housing market. Housing market is so sensitive to the Federal Reserve, but it's also a part of the economy too. Yeah. I mean, the Federal Reserve is doing this not for the housing market specifically, although yeah. they'll talk about it, but they're doing it for the economy. And the housing prices are a big part of the economy. It moves inflation, it moves the economy, yeah. but it is moved by the economy. And you better believe that if it's a recession, then housing prices are gonna go down, probably. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, I think this article is really, and, and we've hinted at it, but it's promoting like a very defensive, cash-heavy position. Um, I think he's right that the stock market doesn't look great, but I don't. Th- I think he gives alternative real estate investments like multifamily a little bit of a short shrift. Mm. It uh, uh, multifamily does mirror the single-family market, but um, yeah. multifamily w- or b- but renters when they're going to rent, they're not thinking about mortgage rates in the same way that home buyers are. Now I said we have covered before, and I do believe that like they're not pouring into the apartment market from you know would-be home buyers aren't pouring into the apartment market, but the same things that are deadening single family demand are not, you know, Federal Reserve is not part of a renter's calculation in the same way that a single family home buyers is. So it's yeah. hard to think that, that, you know, we make multifamily may be continuing at a more stable pace than single family just because of that one thing, you know, that one factor. Again, there could be a global, uh, a whole global recession yeah, that affects typically does. But. I mean, the only thing that, you know, the housing market has going for it um, beyond just we still don't have don't have enough housing units mm-hmm. in general is that so many people either bought or refinanced um, their homes in the last yeah. 18 months with incredibly low interest rates. Why would someone who j- just locked in a, you know, sub 3%, mid 3% mm-hmm. rate with 30 year term on it? Why would they, why would they be looking to move or, or to sell? Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, to, because you're going to buy half the house today if you're going to buy something different. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, renting is you know, relative more expensive than it used to be. It's less expensive than going out and buying a home. You know, that's for sure. And looking at rents versus now, I yeah. mean, the mortgage again, the interest rate you're paying is is doubled. You know, rents have not doubled in yeah. the last year. Um, so it's renting still relatively affordable. But people aren't going to just sell their house just to sell their house right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, you know, without the sellers and the volume of sellers, you can have a frozen market, which is kind of what we're seeing in the multifamily market yeah. also. But that doesn't mean you see like massive price declines because the volume is just going to be so low. So you can only move it so, yeah. so much. And that's what we saw. Uh, what And I, I don't think we covered this, but the Case Shiller um, home yeah. price index did, uh, did come out recently and it showed, you know, it, it showed a decline. Uh, yeah, this is the one. It showed a decline, but not, it's, it wasn't like a huge Huge. See, there it is. Yeah. See, we're not looking at like a spike downward, but we are looking at a gentle slope downward. And um, and usually you don't see that if you look at like the three or five years, it doesn't it doesn't usually even gently slope downwards like the, like what we're seeing now. Um, so that's so. So it is interesting. It is very much, I think, a proof of these people can't pay the mortgage payments. Um, mortgage payments are still really high. Um, and the lowering of home prices, I don't think, has equaled the rise that someone would have to pay due to higher interest rates. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, I, I, absolutely. I mean, just month over month, you know, it's a we're down a percent. Yeah. Quarter to quarter, up one and a half percent. Year to date, we're still up nine percent. Mm-hmm. So certainly not a crash yet. Yeah. And again, where is the all the selling pressure going to come from? The buying pressure isn't there, but the sellers aren't there. You mm-hmm. know, it's not that you know the buyers. You don't have to just be a absent of buyers. There mm-hmm. has to be also a, an oversupply of of sellers. Yeah. If there's zero sellers yeah. and zero buyers, well, the, the price isn't going to move any isn't going to move anywhere. Yeah. So. Um, I, and obviously, it's something they're going to continue to watch, um, but I, I don't think that um, it's going to be as bad for the housing market mm-hmm. um, as some people are predicting. I think we're, yeah. we're definitely going to go through a correction that's probably mm-hmm. warranted, but it's not, I don't think, going to be the crash that some people are talking about. Yeah. And, and I want to go through, Matt, over the last just couple of years, um, even go past five years, mm-hmm. ten, 10 years, every single year, I want to pull, I want to pull all the housing crash articles yeah. every single, every single year. I, I was, I was just going to say like, if you read, if you read YouTube thumbnails, you would think that we're, we're heading towards a 50% reduction. And it's in like prices. certain they're like, so just wait, just wait, yeah, just wait. Yeah. But it, it, in 20, in 2017, people were saying the same thing. Just wait, mm-hmm. you know, just wait. And in 2019, I remember there was this one outlet that may have like since disappeared, but like they had a cottage industry of just writing articles about like this, the housing market's getting ready to crash. This is why the housing market's going to get yeah. ready to crash. And they would take like data and misinterpret it. And, mm-hmm. and then of course, when the pandemic hit, it was like absolute certain. And then there were all these foreclosures of the backlog because you had an you know, eviction moratorium and we had, you know, forbearance, people, when forbearance runs out. All these people are going to, you know, just all default and there's going to be an avalanche of foreclosures. And here's the data on there's this, you know, there's half a million foreclosures here and there. And, and that happened. Well, and that's and and that's kind of what I was thinking too. Is like I, I'm. It's almost a reassuring now, as you know, a, a, as helpless as I am to the Federal Reserve. Although, if Jerome Powell, if you're watching, just don't I don't raise rates. I think it does. <laughs> it, it's it is almost a little bit reassuring that this is an external factor that's that's uh, that's pressured upon the the housing market and driving housing prices up. It's not necessarily like the subprime mortgage crisis or or anything like that. It is the pressure of higher mortgage payments and man if 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 it's a recession then that's going to happen to everyone but i don't think that there is this like i i keep having this fear that there's this unknown unknown in the housing market that's we're going to suddenly find out that everything's hollow everything's going to implode and and it, you know it's going to seem so obvious to us but we just don't see it in the housing market right now and that's what i don't yeah. i don't see it. you know we've been we spent the past 2 years kind of saying yeah it makes sense that 
that people are buying more houses. They got to work from home. You know, the pandemic hit. There's lockdowns. There's an increased value of the home. There's demographics. Uh, there's demographics. There's a lot of reasons why why housing would go up. Um, but but looking at the pattern, you know, you you feel almost foolish to think that uh, to think that you were optimistic once. So, yeah. uh, but even so, like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna suddenly stop thinking of all these reasons why there should be housing demand. And so um, we may maybe there will be a slight correction. But I don't. I, I have a hard time thinking that it'll drop, drop down to you know what it was before the pandemic. Yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I agree. We shall see. I mean, yep. you know, if we do go into just a massively deep recession and unemployment finally ticks yeah. up, then people lose their jobs and they can't pay their mortgage and they do go into foreclosure. And that, yeah. I mean, that's. I mean, I, that that's the path that I see. Mm-hmm. But that requires. Yeah, unemployment to tick up, and then in that type of scenario, um, that's when I, I do think we could see some softening on rates and monetary yeah. policy. Yeah. So you know, it would start swinging back the other way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot of food for thought, Matt. I know. I, I I told you I was like I almost. There's just so much, <laughs> so much stuff that came out. There's so much this week. Um, I hate for anyone to miss any episode of The Great Report, Matt. So make sure you're subscribed to The Great Capital YouTube channel. You can watch The Great Report videos every single day and with clips and obviously the weekly, the longer video. Um, listen to us on the podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen in the car while you're working out, etc. Follow us on social media. Leave mm-hmm. a comment. We need, we're going to get to the comment next week, right? Yep, okay. that's true. We, we're going to be going over some uh, viewers' comments next week. So make sure you leave a comment below this video, other Great Report videos, and we'll... Um, you know, we'll feature it on the show and give you our two cents in addition to replying on YouTube. Um, we're, we're, we're pretty good at, pretty good yeah. at that. Um, so, yeah, I'd love to have a conversation with you. And, again, as always, if you are an accredited investor and you like the way we are looking at the multifamily market, the housing market, um, hop on over to Gray.Fund and learn more about uh, the Gray Fund, Gray Capital's stabilized multifamily investment, um, investment fund. We've got a lot of cool deals in there. Find good deals, finding good opportunities, even in this crazy market. Mm-hmm. Can't tell you all the details right now. I'll go to the YouTube channel. We've got all, we've got a bunch of webinars, um, or you can just schedule a meeting and like just talk to us about it. We're like we're here, we're ready to go, we're available. Not like we're busy, but we will make we will make time. Especially if someone's like, I'm a I am a viewer of the Gray Report. I know. What's more fun? You're going to the front of the line. <laughs> That's front right. of the line. All right. Catch you next week. Have a good one. See you in the next Gray Report.